My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. I'm going to make friends. I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Whenever you're listening to anyone's investing advice, you need to consider the source. And ideally, you want to know where that person is coming from. That's why tonight I'm going to tell you exactly who I am and how I got here. No, not the standard introduction. I'm Jim Kramer, host of Mad Money, co-host of the Squawk of the Street, chief of the CBC Investing Club. What I want to do tonight in an extremely special show by even my wacky standards is trace the arc that brought me to Mad Money. Not for some autobiographical ego trip, but to kind of give you some money-making lessons from the phases of my various careers. And explain, of course, how you can pop the phone. Remember, in the end, this is Kramerica, and everything we do here is about trying to help you make money. In short, I'm giving you the Invest in Kramer guidebook, what I call that, the skinny on how I learned to be a good investor and how I continue to learn every day so I can help you become better than I ever, or I want you to be better than I ever want to be. By the way, that's our mission in the investing club, too. Let's start real early. My love of stocks didn't begin after law school or college or even high school. No, my love for stocks started back in fourth grade. That's right, fourth grade. You see, my dad would bring home the old Philadelphia Bulletin. Boy, that rings quite a long time ago that was. At that point, the Philadelphia Bulletin was one of the largest newspapers in the country. He'd have it when he came back from work every night and give it to me. I wanted the comics and the sports. I was a ridiculous Phillies fan back then. I still am. Uh, it's a lifelong affliction, I guess, although I have pivoted hard toward the Eagles. I was also a curious kid. Curiosity's always been both a blessing and a curse for me. Not like the proverbial cat that's always probing, looking, and occasionally jumping on some hot stoves. Anyway, there was always this solid chunk of the paper that seemed impenetrable to me, the business section. It was impenetrable because it had these giant lists and names of an agate type that seemed to go on forever. There were the other tables, different from the batting averages tables and box scores I'd scrutinize with regularity. When I read them from left to right, they made no sense to me whatsoever. Open, range, closed? I mean, what, what, what's open? What range? What closed? What were these strange things? Why did they matter? I asked my dad, who I knew dabbled in the stock market, because occasionally I hear him get mad when he heard prices that were mentioned on the radio. In particular, he always seemed to get angry when I, I heard something called national video and how it went out. I don't know what video did other than go out and why it went out. I don't know if Pop did either, though. But I know it made him furious. I wanted to know why. So he sat me down one day and explained that each of those lines represented the performance of a stock at a company on a different day. The open was where the stock opened in the morning. The range was how low and high it traded during the day. And the close was what it was worth at the end of the day. That fascinated me. I mean, how could there be so many companies and why the heck did they trade in ranges? He told me that each day people tried very hard to figure out which stocks would go up in value and they wanted to buy them so they could make money from those moves. Frankly, this struck me as downright silly. I told him that when I looked at the baseball tables, I was always trying to figure out who was hot, who'd go up on average, who'd go down, and what it'd mean for the teams I liked, specifically, of course, the Phillies. He said it was pretty much the same thing with stocks. You studied the companies like the, you studied the players. Some players were doing just okay. Some were hot as a pistol. And, of course, others were just playing duds. I told him I wanted to figure it out the stock market, too. I wanted to figure out which stocks would go higher, just like everybody else. I wanted to know if I could learn something from just following the ranges and reading the tables. He said, why don't you try? It, it seemed in my house the radio was always on until Pop put the TV on in time for dinner. We always watched the news while eating, even as I admit I hated it because most of the news was about the war, and that meant the Vietnam War, and it was really seemed going well at all. But right after the world news on the radio or TV, they always mentioned Dow Jones Industrial Averages. And they either talked about or showed the most active stocks then, the ones that had done best or worst. National video, pop stock was off from the worst list. And that's why I guess my dad was so angry. So what I did was write down the names that I heard, and I tracked them. Kept them in a ledger I still have. What a terrific game it was, trying to figure out the next move of a stock, not a player. Even as all I really knew was the name. Most of them were defense stocks, and they went up a lot in tandem with the war. After a year, I decided that was such a cool game that I wanted to introduce it to my fifth grade class. 
And so I did, going in, show and tell with the Philadelphia Bolton, showing them that Ledger, inviting them to play to see who could find stocks that will end up the most during the week. Needless to say, not everyone was into it, but the darnest thing happened not long after. My dad's company at the time, National Gift Wrap and Box Company, represented 3M, then known as the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company in the Philadelphia area. He sold tape and sashine. That was a fancy ribbon that bowed easily. Remember there was a time when you had to make your own bows? Triple M, as we called it, was always innovating, coming with new product lines, which it still does. But these days, it's also plagued, unfortunately, by major litigation issues. Right about fifth grade, Pop came home with a new line of 3M products he was selling. Games! That's right. They got into what was known as 3M bookshelf games. He said, perhaps I might want to learn more about the stock market. And he, he had two games that he was selling well about business. One was Acquire, about takeovers, and the other was Stocks and Bonds. I always cry when a good friend bought me this recently. I love that game so much. And at one point, I even asked the old CEO of 3M, bring the games back. Apparently, I don't own the rights anymore. But the point of mentioning all this, from my own mixture of stock game to stocks and bonds, is the stocks are fascinating enough to get your kids started on them right now. And I'm urging you to do just that. It's easier than ever. Pick some stocks, maybe some stocks of companies that your kids are familiar with. Then have them track those and guess which will do best over time. So here's the bottom line. The bottom line, at least of my childhood stock market obsession. Get them started early and they may play for life. Because, alas, the stock market, it's a long-term contest. The earlier you get in, the more you can potentially win over the long haul. Let's go to Dave in California, please. Dave. Hey, Jim. Thanks for taking my call. Of course. What's up, Dave? Jim, I'm an older retired investor who's moving most of my stock portfolio gains into T-bonds and CDs. What are the advantages of bond ladders, and how do those work? Well, I mean, I, I look, I think that... You, you, what I like about a bond ladder is it, it, it would normally matter a great deal. <laughs> the yield curve is so flat. I'm trying to think. It really doesn't make me. People want a ladder bonds right now. It really doesn't make a lot of sense. I want you to stay short. Uh, no reason to go out in the long end. Uh, and you can just keep reinvesting like that. But I also want, I'm not sure of your age, but I always want people to remember that I think you don't want to bet against yourself and put too much money in bonds because stocks still represent the greatest opportunity. And don't forget, utility stocks, they can play a role, too. They could have multiple years of goodness. Let's go to Philip in Michigan, please. Philip. Booyah, Jim. What's up, Philip? Hey, I wanted to thank you. I've been listening to uh, your show since 2006. It's one of my co-workers turned, turned me on to the show, and uh, you've made me all sorts of mad money. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm also a member of the CMBC Investing Club, so I, I enjoy tuning in to you every day and listening to you there as well. Okay. My question, my question is, um, so I know that you uh, refer to dividend reinvestment as the eighth one of the world, and I'm totally there with you. All right. My specific question is, is should I involve myself in my brokerage dip program, or should I take the cash? And then put it back to work in a stock. When uh, no, I am a huge dividend reinvestment plan person. That's, uh, that's, uh, and as a matter of fact, I wish there weren't, weren't an alternative. But for my Chapel Trust, I have to send the dividends out. And it has really hurt my long-term performance. You can't, you've got to reinvest them. That's where some big money can be made. Right, one of the biggest things I learned from getting interested in the stock market early is that it is a long-term contest. The earlier you get in, the more you can potentially win over the long haul. On my money tonight, I'm giving you an inside look at how I got to where I am today, from growing up to Goldman Sachs. Along the way, you'll learn the best practices I learned about the market and how you can incorporate these life lessons yourself. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.